All right, warm welcome here. It's really nice to see that so many people could uh, take the time and come and discuss the Walking the Talk report. Um, so we've been, let me give you a little bit of the background for uh, why we've been invited you here, is that this is the third time that we do what we call the Walking the Talk report, uh, which is really about trying to understand or explore the sustainability communication from the large cap companies on the Omex, uh, NASDAQ, Stockholm list. Uh, previously, so this is the third year, we did it in 2015, we did it in 2017, and we're doing it now on for 2019, which is looking at the reports for the, the year, the fiscal year 2018. Uh, this is actually the first time that we've given you the opportunity to come in and that we can discuss the variables that we've ranked. Uh, not least of all because we, we've experienced that quite a lot of companies contact us and we're, there's just unfortunately no chance for us to meet with every company individually basically. So we thought we'd give you this opportunity. Um, let me also say that uh, with the great help of our SSE support, student support here, uh, we will be filming this. We're both live streaming it through Zoom and we'll also be uh, recording it so that you can find the whole seminar on the, the MISUM homepage later. Uh, so there may also be some questions. We hope that there'll be some people on Zoom. Uh, and uh, when we're going through this, I'd really like, you know, we were thinking of doing kind of a round table really in the beginning, um, but then we realized that there were more people than would actually work with the round table, but our idea and hope is that we have an interactive discussion. Uh, so please do interrupt me. Uh, when you do so, because of the technical aspects, it would be great if you say your name and your the company that you represent and speak very loudly. Otherwise, I will have to, I will repeat your question. But I think if we speak loudly enough that it might work anyhow. Uh, okay, so jumping right in, and I prepared some slides both from the past to give you an idea, uh, but also um, to kind of jumpstart the discussion really a little bit. Let me just say right away that we are three people in the project team. We have two great SSE students here. Uh, we have uh, Ilva Foschlund, uh, an MSc student in economics. And then we have Martina Kaplanova, uh, also an SSE master's student in finance, right? Or is it vice versa? Sorry, <laughs> vice versa. Um, so we're working together. Uh, I'm an associate professor here at the Department of Marketing and Strategy, affiliated to the Mr. Center for Sustainable Markets, uh, where the, the work really is being done and the, the project is hosted, you can say. Um, I'm responsible for building up the coding scheme, which is very much based on different uh, research strands, but also a lot of practitioner uh, materials that we brought in these different uh, KPIs. Uh, Ulva and Martina, luckily, are, I'm very happy to say, will be doing a lot, most of the coding work and as you'll see this is there's a lot of coding to be done so this is why we actually only do this every other year we just don't have the possibility of doing it every year unfortunately uh, jumping right in welcome uh, jumping right in so again as I said this is the third biennial report that we do and it's always on the year the fiscal year before uh, and we really want to try to explore sustainability communication, both the visions, strategies, policies, goals, implementation, but also what we call the, the walk side, the follow-up. Um, what we're looking at is what, we're, what you say that you're doing, uh, and then we're trying to find evidence to see that you're actually doing what you're saying you're doing, in a sense. So in many ways, when we're saying walking the talk, uh, it's, it's hard for us to go in and actually evaluate if you're doing it, right? 
but we're looking at how you actually report that you're you're doing you know you're following up on your code of conduct you're doing uh, you're implementing different courses for your employees on different sustainability issues and and this is very much from kind of a research strand that says that most companies will not go out and say something that is not true you will most likely publish things that you're actually following up on and actually doing. And then we get more into the nitty gritty of how you actually do it in a sense. Uh, we have made a very uh, concrete research choice and that is that we don't do case studies of each company. We look at your annual reports, your sustainability reports, and then we look at your websites to find the different uh, the different communication and information on sustainability we do this very you know committedly i would say we've done this very precise exactly because we need to see what is officially publicly communicated uh, we do get a lot of comments from companies who come back to us and say that oh but we do this and we do that um, but we don't communicate it we're not really sure why you don't communicate it then if, you, if you're doing it, in a sense. Uh, and the variables that we're looking at, we also get some, quite a lot of questions that this variable or that variable is not uh, that well suited to our industry or our sector. The variables that we're using, and, and let me ask, have you had the chance to look at the variables? A little bit, not at all, okay. Uh, the variables that we look at we think are relevant for all sectors and in all uh, companies basically so they're not you know if you go at the SASB standards you'll go into very specific sector specific we're looking at those things that we think are relevant for all contexts and all companies so it's very much at a top level you can say uh, on the large cap list in 2015, we had 72 companies. 2017, we had 88 companies. This year, we have 97 companies. So it seems to keep growing. And this is actually something that we should talk with our finance people about because around the world, there's actually uh, more and more companies that are delisting from uh, the stock exchanges. So it's actually interesting in Sweden, the large cap, the number of population of large cap companies is growing, which is actually kind of against the, the stream globally, which I find interesting. Um, what I think there is, you know, when I, when I say also this, I think if I, I don't have the concrete numbers, but in 2015, we coded some 11,000 pages. So you can imagine what kind of work this is. Uh, in 2017, I think there was about 15,000 pages we coded. And so this year, you guys, there's probably gonna be even more since we have more companies. Uh, just a few kind of headliners from what we saw between the changes between the 2015 report we did and the 2017 report. Uh, we found some really positive changes, I would say, that first of all, uh, sustainability, corporate responsibility moved up the strategic agenda of companies. Uh, we found that some 50% uh, communicated as critical to their core strategy, and that's up for 22% in only two years. We found that interesting. 43% uh, of the large cap companies had sustainability and corporate responsibility in the position, a identified position within the, the executive management team. That's also kind of interesting and we're really curious what it will look like for this year because we hear anecdotes about uh, sustainability managers being thrown out of the executive leadership or management team. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a trend here. 75% uh, of the companies communicated defined measurable goals, and which was up from 51%. There was a marked increase in the number of companies that had human rights policies and that communicated details on how they followed up on their policies. Uh, very few still have integrated reporting, but some more. So it went from some 1%, maybe one company or something like that in 2015, up to 7% in uh, 2017. 
and only seven companies communicated goals now for the 2017 uh, report. Only seven companies communicated goals beyond 2020. And we're talking about then three years, really. Uh, well, and only four beyond 2030. And we found that also very interesting. It'd be interesting to hear your, your take on why that is so. Methods and research design. So what we do is we do the coding uh, of the annual re your annual report, sustainability reports and home pages. And most of your reports are probably coming out around April. Is that about right? Yeah. August. Sorry. August. In August. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, no. Here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to consider that because it yeah. may be that we'll have to throw your company out of the, the population then. Yeah. Or there's other ways to get the report to KPIs. Yeah, but it has to be published, you know, published material. It has to be yeah. e the same for all companies. That's yeah. the, the issue. Yeah, we could be that we are to include in the report just that. Yeah. Well, let, let, we'll yeah. take that offline and have a discussion on that, okay. how we do with that. Good point. Um, what we will then do is that we'll make, which we've always done, is we make an in individual scoring sheet for each company. These are not published anywhere, but we go through each company's individual scoring and we send it to your company contact. And and uh, let me say here also, if because we, you know, looking for a diff who's responsible for sustainability in each of the company isn't always easy, which is, it's also interesting in the sense that it's very hard sometimes to find who is it who's responsible for sustainability in your company. So if we sent, you got the invite, those are the updated contact lists we have. If we have the wrong name, the wrong contact, please do let us know because we will be sending this report individually to each of your companies. Then you'll have th about three to four weeks, probably around three weeks to respond to us so that you can go through your reporting or the, the variables and the points that you got and come back to us if you see that there's something clearly omitted from your public statements. Because with the, with the, with the knowledge that we're, we're coding some 15 to 20,000 pages, uh, it does happen that we've missed something. And we're giving you the opportunity then to come and revert to us and say and sh cite to us where it is that we've missed, okay? So this is how, we've done this now twice and that's worked actually quite well. Um, Companies have come back and they've cited exactly where we've missed some information, then we can change the scoring. Uh, but we've also had uh, situations where they've come back and it's been so vague that we haven't, you know, we've, we're, we're trying to be as fair as possible that we score everyone in the same way. So if it is not very clear and it's very vague, then we may not even, you know, upgrade or downgrade. Uh, the scoring, but it's I, I we we also do this so we send it out in August, so hopefully uh, uh, around the time most people are, are back from their vacations, and then they'll have some time into September to be able to go through it. Okay, uh, and then we'll launch the report in uh, sometime towards the end of September when we come out with the full ranking uh, sheets. If you look at for those of you who haven't seen the ranking. Um, you can take one of these with you. This was the report for 2017. There you'll see how we, we list all of the companies with their total scores. We don't give a detailed uh, scoring sheet, but it's more with the total scores and how they're doing uh, divided up into sectors. So do take one of these with you. And also uh, in this the scoring scheme that showed you very clearly how we're coding the data, how many points you get for the different parts. Okay. We have decided, oh, I'm sorry, I was supposed to stand here. <laughs> um, 
So if we look at the different variables, and let me say right away that we've decided uh, to keep the same variables and scoring scheme that we've had for previous years. The reason why we do that is because we want to be able to see progression and the trends going on. So we keep the same, but we're also discussing, which I'll come to later, a number of new variables that we feel uh, should have been included maybe in the beginning, but not least of all to reflect the changes have happened since 2015. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we consider other things uh, and more things, I think, important for corporate responsibility and sustainability. Um, but in general, and again, you have it in the scoring scheme, how we actually code it, but we have variables on the talk side, how you communicate your sustainability and corporate responsibility, what's on the website, uh, how it comes into the CEO statements, the mission, vision, and core values that are stated in your different reports. We look at uh, the strategic direction, and as I was mentioning, we see that uh, sustainability is coming much more into the corporate strategy, which we think is very positive. Uh, we look at it in the risk management section, and then we not least of all looked at, at uh, how you define targets, measurable targets. Uh, principled commitment is kind of the label for the different policies that you state that you have. Uh, on the walk variable, we've looked at uh, integrated reporting, ex how much is externally audited, third-party audited, uh, GRI reporting, uh, follow-up actions that's, that you get really contract or um, get very specific on how you report your, that you're following up on your targets and your different policies. Uh, and then we look at top level commitment, whether or not the code of conduct is signed by your CEO. Uh, again, I, I was mentioning this about the, whether or not you have an identified person uh, in the executive and management team. Uh, and then gender balance in the board of directors is something we've looked at. <coughs> Shall before we go into new variables, any comments or questions on what we're looking at? Can, you, can I ask you to state your name and the company you represent and speak loudly? Sure. <laughs> I, uh, I work at Electa. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in Kikisa. And I was wondering um, about the standards for reporting accountability. Uh, how you have chosen these three, why, and uh, why the score? Because these are questions that are continuously discussed yeah. and debated what the value there, the, the true value of, of these. What well, do you mean about integrated reporting? Or? Yes, integrated and also GRI reporting. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, We've chosen it out from different perspectives, not least from, uh, from um, I would say, more practitioner-oriented uh, research. Uh, external assurance, I think, is, uh, you know, the third-party audit and the, the, the uh, uh, credibility of it uh, is important. Integrated reporting, I think, is there's moves towards having, not least of all, more connection with your business model and uh, or your, your financial statements and your sustainability work. So I think that's reasonable. Uh, the GRI thing, I can understand, but some about some 50% at least of the Swedish companies are members of GRI, then they report in different ways. GRI is the global, uh, probably the largest initiative for reporting the GRI. So I, you know, you could say SASB is another one, uh, standard for, which is sector specific. I think that'll be harder in many ways. It's also very Anglo-Saxon Anglo perspective more than it is a European one. But I can understand that you may have questions about the GRI part. We've moved from, uh, we started out with, um, I think it was GRI 3 when we did it in 2015. Uh, then we moved to 20, uh, the GRI 4, now it's just the GRI standard. So we'll be looking at, you know, if you look at the point schemes, it's one, two, and three, I think it was. Is it? 
It's one, two, and three are um, points for the GRI. Yeah, no, zero one, to two, two points. Two, yeah. Zero to two points. But also integrated reporting could be, I mean, it's not per se a good thing. We do well, think it is. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, a good, that's what I want to hear. Is yeah. that something you really think is good? We then? believe that's important. And a lot of research uh, supports us on that. Okay. So it's a move that companies are going to. We're not super strict on if you which framework you you use, yeah. but we do think that the field should be going towards that. We need to connect uh, the financial statements with the sustainability. So is that like the definition that you will look at, for example, if there's a connection I mean there could be I mean there are different degrees of yeah yeah and, and I mean given that uh, there's so many variables we do realize that you know on some things you may be doing really well on and other things you you might not be doing it's going to be sector somewhat sector specific but it kind of evens itself out anyway in that sense a good question yeah no, we, I mean, research-wise, we believe it's a good move. Mine is doing very um, A question regarding the CO statement. Uh, you specifically talk about the CO statement in the annual report. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we have a CO statement in the sustainability report where we, where our CO um, is much more <laughs> um, taking everything into account. In yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, most companies actually don't have integrated reporting. So they have a sustainability report and they have an annual report, right? And the sustainability report, there you go into all sorts of things, but do all of your stakeholders read the sustainability report? Probably not. Right, so we do, again, it's connected to this about integrated reporting and that if sustainability is important, it should probably be in your annual report as well. Okay, so if you, so if we refer uh, in this CO statement in the annual report to the sustainability report, will you take both of those into account? The, the CEO usually makes a statement on the strategic direction of the company, right? Yeah. yeah? Um, if he just says, uh, he says that we will be working towards sustainability, blah, 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 or, or, you know, that he makes mention to it, but just referring to the sustainability report doesn't really seem like he's bringing that into his strategic, I mean, vision for the company, direction for the company. That, that becomes, to me, a little bit pushing it off to the side again. I'm thinking that we are... Yeah. He's talking much more about the strategies of the system. Yeah, of course he does. But that's not mentioned in the annual report because there's no space for being that. Yeah. But, but it's again, uh, you know, coming back to this about uh, us seeing now that some 50% of the companies have their CEOs talking about sustainability as the core, a part of their core strategy for the company. It's not, you know, it also reflects if you see sustainability as not core or important for the strategy of the firm. If you say that, well, you know, we'll deal with sustainability in a separate report. I mean, it's your choice to do, obviously, but, but it does say something, I think. Well, the, the sustainability report and the annual report, they are released at the same time. Mm -hmm. They are seen as a reporting package with different target groups. Um, and so we don't see it, the sustainability report to be less um, valuable, so to speak, which is uh, reflected in this uh, mm -hmm. criteria that annual report is a bit more important. But we know that investors read, depending on, unless they're very interested on the sustainability side, they'll read the annual report. They may not always read the sustainability report. So it's a choice that we've made. Um, 
like it or not in a, in, in a sense, but this whole movement towards uh, bringing sustainability as a core strategic part of the, the strategies going forward. That needs to be reflected you know, in what we'd say that the, the, ba the main report is for a company. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah, I mean, because I've been talking to a lot of investors and many actually say that it's a very good thing to have a separate sustainability report. Mm -hmm. Because they have, you know, then they have everything they know. And it's getting more and more criteria even for investors to mm -hmm. really, like they're getting pressured to look at these things. So I wouldn't, you know, obviously Animal Report has another type of weight because it has another history and everything. But I mean, it is, um, it's also required by law, isn't it? No, sustain your sustainability report doesn't have to be published in a, in the traditional what we see of sustainability report. Now you have the law uh, that has a very different format for the sustainability reporting that has to be done according to the EU regulation. That's something very different. Most companies actually publish their own sustainability reports that are, do not follow any formats or requirements in that sense. Those are two different things. You have, you know, the one, the requirement from the EU, the sustainability reporting that came into law. That looks very different and it's a published statement that sends in. It's not something that you are required. You're, okay, okay. Those are different things, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Other questions? Say your name, lovely. Hi, I'm Morten from Holman. Have yeah. you talked about including the science-based targets? What do you mean by science-based targets? In your uh, target section. Uh, because you don't quantify the, uh, the aim of the targets, have you? No. So including science-based targets would be a way to... The, the issue we have there is, again, it has to be universal for all of the uh, companies and sectors. But what do you mean then by, I mean, you have in the GRI reporting, for example, you have science-based, what you call science-based targets? Uh, science-based targets is, uh, how do you say it? It's special required from the, from the targets that they, uh, that they based on your company's uh, <laughs> Yes, climate performance-based targets. Okay, so that's what you mean by, because actually most of these targets are also social science-based, but um, are you thinking like CO2 emissions yeah. and, and so on and so forth? Uh, no, we haven't uh, done that. We've said that you can formulate your targets, so you may very well have science-based, and, and you in the paper and pulp industry have been pretty good at that usually, um, but we look at whether or not you have them at all. So we haven't said concretely which of those targets you need to do, um, but we want to see that you actually put up measurable targets. So we're doing that and that's more because it becomes more universal in that way. We're not, you know, we're not going into so, so specific, but the fact is that most companies don't even have measurable targets pub published at all. We'd like to see that that you, from your own knowledge of the industry, actually go in and make those uh, measurable targets. Oh, that could be, yeah. yeah. If, they, if they don't have that, you know how they get kind of punished or they get... Oh, I haven't. I've seen an international EU study uh, on the, the EU requirements on sustainability reporting uh, it doesn't go into that part at all. And, and also not least of all what I've understood from that report that was done, I think it was done last year, no, the beginning of this year. Um, uh, there they actually discussed that there's so many different formats of reporting that it's very difficult to compare these reports, what I've understood. 
Yeah, but it would, it would be, sorry, Lin, Lina de Geer from uh, Norton Entertainment Group, uh, former MTG. <laughs> or, and here we are, MTG, yeah. So, um, I mean, it would be interesting to see if that's a soft law or if it's, I mean, something actually, if they have a mechanism of following that law. Up, yeah, so yeah. It would be really interesting. But, and you guys know this better than I, who do have to do this, uh, the EU reporting on this. What are the, how has it gone that far that there is any follow-up on it in Sweden? And what is the ramifications if you don't do it? For example, I haven't seen anything done yet on it. So, but I, I mean, that, that law in many ways, it probably is also a function of help, you know, while you're doing that reporting and thinking through it, you're learning about your own organizations and where the impacts are as well. So maybe that's the purpose more so than actually penalizing any company or, or anything like that. Hmm? Did you have another, was there, no? Sorry, um, going back to the SPDs. Name um, and... Sorry, <laughs> I'm actually interested that how many companies here have a science based target? Okay, um, I'd like to get your input on, uh, so as I said, we're going to keep the same uh, variables that we're going to rank, not least of all because we want to see the trends and, and uh, see the changes from year to year. Um, but we're considering uh, different new variables and perhaps you guys also have other variables that you think that we should include. So we're considering the SDGs, uh, both that, that, your, that your company reports on how they or that they've identified SDGs that they engage with and you know how it's integrated into their strategies. Um, yeah, and uh, you know these are just beginning thoughts that we're having on news. So very happy to get your thoughts on that. Just wondering what meeting was meant by integration was specifically the company map. Uh, mm -hmm. their actions against SDGs, but the SDGs doesn't actually have a concrete impact on the work that is being carried out. Mm -hmm. So, you need to be very specific on what yeah. you buy into this. Yeah, and I, as I said, this is just the starting thinking about new variables. Um, we haven't had SDGs in the reporting variables before. Um, at this, that said, we found it fascinating that many companies in the 20, so it was the report, the fiscal year 2016 that we looked at in 2017. We found it fascinating that, you know, all the companies were talking about the SDGs and throwing icons in everywhere, right? But what does it really mean is our question. How far has the company considered, you know, one, at least the first step is considering which SDGs that they have the most impact on. And then also some companies had started, I think it was Ikea and Ericsson, who had started looking at, so uh, which of the SDGs do we think that we, we want to work much closer with and actually have much more you know, of a direct impact on and considering our strategies out from that SDG. So I'm, you know, how do you think that we should, should do it? I'm not sure myself, but I, I do think it was, it was also scary to see, except for the paper and pulp industry, um, you know, even though everyone was throwing in SDG icons everywhere, their goals only went to 2020, except in the paper and pulp where they went much further. Um, so maybe do that instead, like looking at how, how many long-term targets. We have that, that we already have. That's how I can yeah. say what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's the one long-term targets. Yeah, that could be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Huh? Because it's very easy to just map your work with certain Yeah, SDGs. and that's why I, I wrote, uh, both identified but integrated, and I'm not sure what that really means, but I agree it has to go further than just throwing in the icons and that we you know play around with those in a sense. Yeah. 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 Y
sorry. I mean, I think clean and egalitarian. I think it could be about alignment as well. Mm -hmm. Because in, I mean, maybe alignment with the material issues. Yeah. Right? Yeah, alignment from your GRA materiality yeah. analysis. Yeah. Because then, of course, take for example, then we have the material issues and then the set of goals and then the SDGs. Yeah. And then also another way of I think it's good if you really define that integration alignment. Mm -hmm. Another way could be is to tap into the targets. Yeah. The SDG targets because they're much more specific. That's what I was yeah, and I mean, trying to translate that to corporate world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, even because we work in the entertainment media sector and we benchmark with, uh, for example, with the Sea and Sky, and, you know, so they, we have a special SDGs for the media mm. sector. I mean, and even I'm sure you have a consultant paper. So if you look into the targets, you have specific, they have identified these yeah. ones are for your, for your industry. And I think then it's easy to talk about integration. Yeah. No, I think that those are really good points. We need to, to consider how we're going to do that, but connecting it to the targets, yeah. I like that. Um, my name is Jenny and I'm from Loomis. Um, so two things. Uh, first of all, the SDGs. Now, I represent Loomis and we mapped up when we did our materiality analysis. We mapped up against the SDGs. Now, I decided not to include the icons in our reporting because mm. I thought that they were a little bit too soft-spoken and that they weren't of any material impact to yeah. the goals that we actually did set up and that we're aspiring to reach. Mm. So for me, you know, I'm not, a, you know, I, I love the SDGs, <laughs> but they did not play a big role for us. And I think that the goals that we have set up are far more important yeah. and much more concrete yeah. than the value of, of you know showing the icons in the sustainability yeah. report that was my first um my first comment the second comment is that i would like to better understand why you are so focused on the long-term goals versus the short-term goals coming from me um we have short-term goals we have uh goals that have been integrated into the strategy period, the financial strategy period, mm -hmm. that runs between 18 and 21. So we have sustainability goals for that period and they're extremely tough. Mm -hmm. And we're focusing 100% on reaching those goals. And whilst doing that, there is no time and effort to be spent on looking beyond that because yeah. we're so busy in reaching the short-term goals. Mm -hmm. Once we reach, but them, do you think that's? I, I, no, no, do no, you I'm think it's a good idea, I'm though? <laughs> so I'm just this yeah. is just the reality yeah. that I'm in. I'm yeah. not saying it's right or wrong, um, but we set pretty tough goals, and now just trying to reach them mm -hmm. is taking a lot more effort than maybe we first realized. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, coming into 21, closing that year, we will of course set new goals, but we won't be able to set them until we know how far we got. No. With, the, no. with the first period. No, so I, I, I hear you. Uh, Let me just clarify though, we're not actually giving you points for long or short term goals. Okay. We're giving you points for measurable goals at all. Um, but a reflection that came out that we saw were that those goals that were measurable goals, they were very short term. But that had nothing to do with the, the ranking or the points given. So it's just a reflection from the discussions in sustainability that we have a lot around uh, short-termism and the investments that need to be made in sustainability in a variety of sectors uh, needs to be much more long-term. And, and then also connected with, you take the SDGs that are at least going to 2030, for example. So that, that it's actually just a reflection that we saw that the goals are very short-term, but you're not getting points uh, plus or minus for that, but it's the fact that you actually have measurable goals. You know, it's a, it, it, we're trying to get beyond again this, it's again the walking the talk that uh, it's, you know, earlier it was really easy to just say, oh, we all work with sustainability and it's really important, but what does that really mean? You know, what, how does that come into your strategy? What are the goals that you're setting? Because you do this for financial goals all the time. Why can't one do that for the sustainability side? Sure, that's a quick question regarding you know, goals instead of setting the goals. <laughs> um, could it be like, does it have to be like, for example, 50-50%, you know, 50% women in, in management, or can it be like increase of women in management? Is that enough? Because then you, we can say no. that we reach the goals. 
or you need to have. I, I, but you know, an increase, that's like we say here at SSC that we're going to have more women professors, <laughs> but nothing, I mean, what are you actually doing? What is the goal that you want to get to in a sense? Uh, so, you know, we'd like to see that you have measurable goals. An increase can mean, you know, 0.1% 0, 0 or, right? So, so, no, we'd like to see numbers. We also have a comment from Osman uh, Yaya, who I believe represents the Teleboy group. Uh, he's joining us via the live stream, and his point is that SDGs, diversity, and stakeholder engagement looks reasonable from their perspective. Uh, however, he points out that SDGs are relevant for the products and services offering mostly while GRI is much better suited to process and internal improvement. Hmm. Good point. Is he waiting for a comment? No. <laughs> That's a good point. Other questions on the long term and short termism? No, I'm just thinking about this. Right. Okay. Hmm? Uh, do you want to answer on? Uh, I was wondering about the lobby expenditure. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me. For a global company? Yeah. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm kind of not sure if one should do that or not. Uh, but let me just take this, this second one first anti discrimination diversity targets. That's something that we haven't had uh, previously in our report, and I think that we should bring it in. Uh, again, looking at the European reports on this, anti-discrimination and diversity act targets are actually quite big in Europe versus what we see here in Sweden. I don't think a whole lot of uh, companies actually report on that. Uh, do they do that now with the, with the new sustainability reporting? You do. I know it's a law in Norway. By the Norwegian companies, they have to bring that in. Uh, you, but I've seen this on European reporting, uh, sustainability reporting, much more so. Does that seem reasonable to you guys? It's quite standard, I think, mm -hmm. to uh, report on whether there's been any incidents. Incidents, rather than yeah. Um, but what I've, I'm well, thinking and, about and policies, yeah. anti-discrimination policies, and how you follow those up on. I think that seems, most companies probably have it. I'm not sure if they report or they make them publicly available, though. Could be part of the, most often it's part of the code. Yeah. But we're going to be, I think we, it's reasonable that we bring in something on that to see what we can see on that side, how Swedish companies are working with this. Yeah. Uh, lobby expenditures, this is something that I read in a European report that they were talking a lot about. We don't really talk that much about that in Sweden. I would say. I'm not sure. I think it's going to be really difficult to bring something in on that. But there is, you know, discussions in uh, sustainability forums that we should be thinking about what, you know, what kind of lobbying expenditures do big multinationals have and, and how we consider that. I, we need to, uh, I'm not sure we can include that in this year's report, but I think coming up it's something that we need to start considering a little bit. And just for explanation, how does that how does that relate to sustainability? I do not understand. Uh, well, I mean, if you're using expending enormous amounts of sums on lobbying uh, public officials or EU, what have you, on changing laws when it comes to a number of sustainability climate issues and so on and so forth, I think that's pretty interesting. You can measure yeah, they have many yeah, different so indices right use that. Uh, I don't think, you know, in the United States there's a lot of d discussion on that. I'm not sure that we're, we're going to be able to do something about that this year, but I think it's, it's a sustainability issue that we need to start considering. It makes sense because it's uh, typically the worst companies in one thing and lobbying in another. So exactly. Yeah. I wasn't even thinking in that direction. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, I mean, that shouldn't be a given. But no, but... So I feel like to always link lobbying with something evil. No, not necessarily. I mean, in, in uh, if I take a, a positive spin on it, I mean, I'd say a lot of the Swedish companies have been lobbying uh, politicians to make stricter sustainability yeah. laws. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
but it's it's definitely something one one should look at. We can't just make that assumption either way, right? Yeah, but then I guess you would want to know what. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure we can bring it in this year, but I think it's something we need to start thinking, how would we look at this mm -hmm. at all? So more looking at the transparency of it. Yeah, arguably. that could be, yeah. That's a good point. Um, business model connected to SCR impact, both positive and negative. And this again comes back to uh, looking at the core strategy of a company's company and their whole business model. I, we think that this is important because it's one thing that you're measured, measuring and looking at different things within your current uh, supply chain, current business model. Is this, you know, how you can do a lot of things good within a bad business model. You see what I mean? Uh, there's been a lot of discussions which you know, poor H&M keeps getting hit by things. They're doing great stuff in their supply chain. But the question is, is the whole business model of fast fashion a okay. great thing? So by business model, you mean kind of like uh, the core, like the sham, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What is your, I mean, we do a lot of reporting on, on different parts of sustainability within the current business model. The question is, does one, does one take a bigger look at the whole business model and which way you're going to steer that and how sustainable that is? Uh, that is something that is coming up more and more in the EU or global discussions around sustainability. How does a company think about that in the future going forward, changing their business model to become more sustainable? Stakeholder engagement is something that we haven't had earlier. I mean, it does go into materiality assessments, but I was thinking about should we bring in something about how the companies are reporting on working with stakeholders. We know that it's important that companies do have good, open, transparent discussions with their stakeholders to be able to see material issues that are, aren't as corporate-centric in a sense that they can see from, that you can see as an external stakeholder, but if you're in, you know, your company working on the same way, how, you know, how many, dis how good discussions do you have to be able to take those perspectives into your work? So we need, again, as I said, there's, uh, you know, these variables are things that we're considering uh, and trying to figure out how could we do this fairly, universally, how can we measure it, and so on and so forth. But these are the, the ones that came top of mind. Do you have other ones that you're thinking that we should be measuring? What are we not seeing that we should be doing? Value, yeah, to make the connection. Yeah, uh, do, you, do you think more in this terms where yes, your whole yeah, business I model? Why that? Because impact is very, I don't know, just acute. I mean, because what we are, we are, I mean, in that we also tend to look at value, the value, mm -hmm. you know, specific that you're creating to society, yeah, to society or to the business. If you can be the business, mm -hmm. if you have a CR activity that creates a business value, or in both values, both societal and business. Mm. Maybe that's too I th I'm wondering, I'm just, I'm thinking about it, I'm wondering how subjective that becomes yeah. for us to measure. So if a company says uh, we're adding value to society because it's better to be there than not, for example, how do we evaluate that? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? I, I'm not sure. I need to, I need to think about it. No, it's, it might be a bit tricky, but that's when we yeah you know if you look at the scoring sheet we're trying to be as objective as it's possible for us to be at the same time as a, you know there is still some measure of subjectivity that comes into it when we're evaluating it. So it's, I, I see what you're trying to say at the same time, I'm not sure how we could do that fairly. 
Can you speak a little light up? WRI are starting with scope four, which is scope one and scope two is against the FGHA company for the company's own direct emissions. Scope three is the indirect surprise emissions. Scope four is like imagine that we have a company that is assessing their own climate impact and also that of their suppliers, and then you have the suppliers of the suppliers, which is not part of the normal scope. Scope mm. four is like the indirect impacts, mm -hmm. not talking about just emission reductions, but there are some work being done to try to quantify these. Of course, this is very difficult, but there's work from yeah. So yeah. Of course, all the impacts cannot be quantified easily. But there's but certainly on the environmental side, uh, it's much easier. It's easier than on the social impact side on on quantifying. Um, but given that there again, you know, that there's so many different sectors here, uh, we're leaving it up to you to decide what you're going to measure and how you're going to meet those targets. In a sense, so what is most relevant to you? Hmm. Other thoughts. No, I was just, I think, I mean, the whole idea of this project is to communicate, that, that you're looking at what companies communicate. Um, so uh, what's missing is what's not being communicated, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which uh, is <laughs> aside of the project, obviously, but it would just be interesting to, because, um, I'm sure there are so many things that companies are doing that are not being communicated. Exactly, yeah. And what is your whole take on that? Like what uh, you just said, you said in the beginning that we don't understand why companies are not communicating. Is that like the whole idea of this project to make companies communicate much more? Or? Well, it's, I mean, the whole, I mean, it started in, when we started looking at this in 2014, we, there was a lot of discussions you know, greenwashing and blue washing and, and whitewashing. <laughs> Nowadays, we're talking about hash walking. So, you know, it was what is it that we can actually see in the communication from companies on sustainability? How important is it really to it? Is it just an external image building kind of thing? Are they uh, legitimate in what they're, they're communicating? Um, the, the things that we're looking at are so general and universal that we're not really sure if you have a code of conduct on corruption, why you wouldn't want to publish that. You know, we, we, and yes, we did have companies who have come to us, but we're doing this and we're doing that, and, but we, we haven't posted it or, or, or what, and I'm not sure what the reason for that is because these things are not competitive secrets, right? I guess it can be just like or how a company is organized. Yeah. Quite often they're not communicators, they're separate yeah, communication partners. But given the, the having a legitimacy and a, a license, a social license to operate, I think uh, just saying, well, we don't normally communicate that or that's that's kind of odd. Mm -hmm. We as ex we are, I'm an external stakeholder and I want to know what they're doing. Then the company can decide, well, we don't want to divulge that information or, you know, we don't care that you want to know, right? But, but I would say that there's more and more interest, not only from financial investors or institutional owners that are investing in the companies, but from the general public are interested in wanting to know how companies are working with their sustainability, I would say. Yeah, so I wonder how strict you are in uh, evaluating uh, certain things. For example, uh, you won't have to write human rights policy and green health and safety policy in order for you to say give a point. Because we might have um, policy writing in a code of conduct. Yeah, but the, no. Necessarily say human rights policy. No. We, we look at the code of conduct and if we find it, I mean, we're trying to. We're not trying to penalize anyone. <laughs> so we look through the documents. If we can't find one called that, we'll look into other documents and see if it's a separate section of that. Yeah. 
just, uh, no, we're not, I mean, again, ranking in a sense is, it's a way of, so people actually sit up and they, they love to see how they're performing according to, rel relative to other companies and everything. But, you know, we're, we're interested in seeing what we can do and then we do the point things and everything like that. So in, in some ways, you may decide that, you know, we think this variable is not interesting for us. Well, then that's fine. Instead, you'll probably do really well on another uh, variable. So, you know, it evens itself out a little bit in that sense. Okay. Right. No, no, but we're, no, we don't, we're not, we're looking that you have it and that it's published. But I mean, it's, it's great if you make it easy for us. <laughs> Sorry, Emma, on this one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, is it, you said before it was part of 2018, so you look at sustainability. Yes. But like our board is, and we've got our annual general meeting tomorrow, mm -hmm. and our board may very well change. Will you look at it per the date then, or will you look at it for 2018? Um, and the same if there's a human rights policy published in two days. Will that be included, or will we only look at exactly what was at the time of No, no, uh, we'll look at the reports that are made for 2018. Yeah. And so your annual report and sustainability report coming out in April or what have you, it is for the past year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's already published. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I was thinking changes made after. So a policy that will be published tomorrow will not be included no. in the um, but will be published on the website. Yeah, no, but we're, we make some type of cutoff in April at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's very updating, and you know, yeah. you basically could come in right in between, right before, yeah. right after, yeah. so it's yeah. critical. Yeah, yeah. no, we'll, we'll revert to you. I, I don't think, for us, it's not that important. I think. We haven't been super strict on it, so it's more that we're going through it. And even, I mean, to be honest, when companies have come back in August and they've shown uh, that we have something on our homepage about this or that, we've actually accepted that because we can't follow daily what you're posting on your web pages, for example. Right. So to be, uh, I, again, I mean. Try to think of this in terms of it's you know it's a way for you to see what is it that's interesting for external stakeholders, how we're looking at it from a research perspective, um, but it's not really out to penalize anyone. And if you have good reasons for them, we accept that. So it's a little bit of a dialogue. We're just in a phase. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, and and. Um, we have, we, I, I stood at end, so you were here, right? Yeah, um, I think the first year uh, stood at end, so did the best in the report, wasn't it? I believe so. I think it was stood at end, so, and um, I, it became, it's interesting how it was used, this report, because uh, some media, quite a lot of media picked it up, and not, all, and not only that, I know stood at end, so you made a big deal out of it and I've seen other companies when they've done well that they're putting it on their websites that they did well in the walking the talk report and and stuff like that but in reality and in the the interviews that I were was involved when it wasn't really about yes I mentioned that the paper and pulp were those who had the longest term goals uh, that the financial uh, or the holding companies did less well than the manufacturing companies. You know, some of the bigger trends, but we're not out to kind of say this company is bad or this company is great or anything like that. It's interesting, you know, in the bigger sphere, where is the sustainability communication moving, kind of. We have a situation. We are separating on Thursday, right? We, uh, uh, we have been partnered with some uh, companies since uh, June. We have a listening on Thursday. Mm. But we have one CR report. Mm. So mm. the question is then, can you use that CR report for both of our companies? And both of yeah. our companies will be in, the, in this report, or will you only use um, let, let me get back to you on that. I know last time we did this, we had one company that was in the similar I wonder if it was SCT and SCA or something like that. 
when they uh, when they uh, disconnected as well so we did something similar uh, ABB last time they didn't have their report before in August so we had to exclude them so we come you know we practically if there's uh, now I know there's one out sell is delisting right so you know practically we'll try to find a find a solution that makes sense uh, in worst case we'll have to just uh, drop it out of the population and, it, and we in the report we describe uh, we list why we dropped different companies it's not because the companies did badly or anything like that but there were different reasons around their listing the change um, what what worries me a little bit I have to say is I'm thinking about, you know, we're having this meeting now, and we're discussing this, and we want to see what you guys are reporting on, and how much are we staring what you're reporting on? You see what I mean? I, I, and most of your companies are so big and multinational that you're part of many different reporting schemes and many different indices and everything like that. Um, so I, I, it's something that we need to think about and describe a little bit because, for example, in the, the oops, let's see, in um, this company's case, I found it fascinating that here, this is an actual company. I've just blocked out the name of the company here. This is like the reporting scheme they got. And we discussed it with them because they went from very low scores to very high scores two years later. And we had a discussion with them, and it was very much because they had taken influence from our reporting scheme, that they started reporting according to the variables that we put up. So I, it is something from a research perspective, we need, you know, it's probably good to consider and reflect a little bit on how we're um, impacting the way you're reporting on your communication. Sustainability. Yeah, uh, Rebecca from Machinery. Uh, just in relation to that, we are, of course, having to come up with some of the variables that mm -hmm. we are putting that yeah. for us will become sort of, sort of a chicken in the box exercise. Yeah. Uh, Why we have tried to discuss with you whether or not you should adjust the variables that we actually have to the sector. So, yeah. so we're, yeah. we're actually putting us or another homing companies or investment companies in one sector. It's slightly different set of variables. Yeah. Is that something that you've discussed for this year as well? Or? No, no. Uh, I, I actually, I know that the holding companies are saying this, <laughs> um, but I, I actually believe that there is, yes, there may be some tick in the box. It's not really. I mean, it's, I think, yeah, it's I mean, still relevant. The point, like, for us, would be meaningless. I mean, we have um, our auditors are in the auditors, our lawyers, some investment banks, and that's basically it. So that will only be for for showing off. So we have a profit of Sure, but we have like more a handful yeah. of people that we work with. We would rather focus on having that kind of requirements for our investment. But you know, we don't go into uh, to deciding whether or not your supplier conduct is really good or not. No, but I mean. Problem. But, but I mean, you can also report on, on saying this about supplier conduct, but how much do you follow up on your, uh, the companies that you invest in, yeah, for we'll example? Yeah, but I think recently we got those words on that because yeah. we didn't have yeah. them explicitly on yeah. But I mean, what we could do in the report is rather than, uh, we're, we're keeping the same scheme uh, because we think they're relevant and not least of all to see, but what we could do is in the report, we can have an, a separate section on the holding companies and describe relative to each other because you have the same uh, challenges. So that's, I mean, that's something that we could do. Maybe not least of all, maybe we should do more of a reflection around the different sectors. You know, see if we can find any uh, variables that they seem that certain sectors are doing very well on and others that they're not reporting very much on. That's something that we could most definitely do. I think that would be uh, uh, making the report better. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. It's our I mean, so, yeah, it's, I know, it's like a code yeah. for sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's what we usually, because we have these 
GRC stand, so we push down for it. Mm. That includes all of those uh, mm. variables that you actually look at in this yeah. uh, rating. But we don't always have those on our top level. No. It says we don't no. have those types of uh, <gasps> businesses, so we don't have that yeah. relevant for our businesses. Uh, that's a good point. I think, I think actually we'll do a better job this year and actually divide. Uh, you know, it also comes to the question: Do you have enough companies within the same sector so that you can actually see, you know, do something more general and not just hold out one company or, or something like that? Maybe we could keep the same ICT sector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a good point. Question here. Yes, we have another point from uh, Rosman from. So my group, and he mentions that he's positive to the report. Um, while it doesn't really, um, while the in, uh, preferences from the report doesn't really influence um, their day-to-day -day actions, uh, he does like them being relevant. He is, however, a bit critical to the assumption that a fully integrated report is positive, and brings up the point that uh, the reason that this hasn't really happened is that it makes. Uh, sustainability tracking a lot more difficult for stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if you could talk a bit about that assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit, uh, a colleague here was bringing up that exact point about integrated reporting. Um, yes, there's literature research-wise both for the, for uh, arguing exactly that point. Uh, I think there's more research arguing that yes, it's difficult to do. It's difficult to do in a meaningful way, not least of all, but it is again connecting sustainability at the top strategic level and not least of all to the financial side of it. There are companies that are doing it that uh, at least is a step on the way and they're doing something both mean meaningful and interesting, we think. Um, but yes, there's both arguments back and forth, and that's probably one of the reasons why so few companies are doing it. I think uh, Atlas Copco was one of the first companies in Sweden that started doing it, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I see. So, but uh, uh, we actually must say we have had uh, fantastic seminars with one of our board members called uh, Bob Eccles. Uh, he's done a lot of seminars here at the school about uh, integrated reporting. So I'm sure the next time he comes, do join one of those seminars. He's a very uh, proponent of integrated reporting. And my name is Teresa. Um, I'm thinking about the GRI reporting criteria because I don't see any GRI standards in there. Uh, no, we no uh, uh, that's what I was saying. The old days, first it was DRA 3, then it was DRA 4, now it's DRI standards, right? So we're, we're going to move it up that way. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the old ones that would only went to DRI 4, I think, then, two years ago. Absolutely right. Yeah, I was thinking that it's kind of a misnormer because the other ones, the old ones, you're according to DRI, you're not allowed to use them anymore. So oh, okay, okay, it's yeah. Binary, yeah. either you use yeah. standards or you. Yeah. No. So well, maybe we'll have to change that. I I'm actually thinking also there may be other reporting standards that might be interesting as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be GRI. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that. This is, so this is from the last, last time we did this. That's why it's still on the old standards. Written but we'll change that. Okay, unless you have any other questions, you're, you're welcome to email us with specific questions. Again, it's a little bit hard for us to take a meeting with every single company, um, but we're pretty good at answering on, on email as fast as we can. Uh, when you get your scores out in, in August, uh, do, you know, do let us know if we have the right contact name so we're, we ensure that you actually get your, uh, your score and then come back to us as quick as possible if you see something that's strange. Uh, overall, I must say that most companies have come back and felt, I mean, it's only a handful who say you've missed this or, or that. Uh, most companies feel that we have caught it. 
Um, and I would say most overall companies have been pretty positive that we're doing this as well. Just a question on timing. When do you think in August you'll be coming back to us? Is it like the beginning or in late August? Uh, probably mid-August you'll get your own reports and then uh, you'll have about three, three weeks. We think most people are back by September, right? I know people are moving their vacations further, further into August, like Europeans are doing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, I'm sure it will go well. Thanks.